the vent room where respiratory therapists can come and get a little inspiration. I'm your host, Dr. Tabitha Dragonberry. As a respiratory therapist, we hear terms about patient safety and quality, and many departments have quality matrix that guide departmental change and improvements. Today, we're speaking with Lexi Carraway. She's a respiratory care manager about quality and change projects. Lexi, welcome to the vent room. Good morning. Thank you. All right. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your current role? Yes, I am the manager of respiratory therapy at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health Center in Mattoon, Illinois. I've been a respiratory therapist for about eight years, and I have been the manager here for three years. My husband and I have three kids who keep us very busy, and I am the chapter chair of Chapter 4 for the Illinois Society for Respiratory Care, and um, that's a little bit about me. All right. No, it's great to get to know you. Lexi and I first connected when I saw a post on LinkedIn about her poster presentation at last year's AARC Open Forum about quality improvement. When we're talking quality, without metrics, there's nothing to measure. Why is it important for departments to focus on continuous quality improvement? Well, we monitor quite a few different um, metrics here where I work, and I feel like you can't really improve patient safety or any of your things you're working on if you don't measure something to begin with. How do you identify which metrics to start measuring? We do a lot with our ventilator patients and anything that we have identified that we're not doing such a great job on or that um, we've noticed uh, has been slipping a little bit have been areas that we've really tried to work to improve. We've been working hard to improve our VAE rates and also our pressure injury rates here in the last year or so at Sarah Bush. I think that a lot of people, especially with VAE and especially skin, I always see comments of trying to figure out how to best care for patient skin when they're needing non-invasive for long periods of time. For your ARC open forum that you presented, what was the quality of project that you did for that? So we had reduced our median ventilator days by 24%. And that was about after a year of implementing a new process, which was what I did my project on. And for that, how did you establish the idea of that quality improvement project making it a reality? Who did you have to get the buy-in from within the organization? Well, we were actually approached from our telemedicine company we partner with. It's called Advanced ICU Services out of St. Louis, Missouri. And they had been monitoring our median vent days and they monitor a ton of different metrics for us. And since they're actually pretty close by us, they're about two hours away from us, we trial a lot of things here for them before they roll them out to their whole company and to a lot of other hospitals. So they ask if we would um, basically trial and help them tweak their protocol for this. So we did and they were on site here for a few days and we worked out an algorithm and did quite a bit of work on it, just partnering with them and rolled it out here to nursing, trained nurses and respiratory therapists on it. And then we were able to have conference calls about every couple of weeks with the critical care manager and director at the time and um, just really improved the process. So how do you use the, I guess, EICU in your workflow? So they are monitoring our ventilated patients and actually all patients in our nine med critical care unit around the clock. And we can consult them. They have respiratory therapists on staff, I think 12 hours a day and even on the weekends. So we can consult them to see what they think and get input from their pulmonologists and doctors. We don't actually have pulmonology here every day at Sarah Bush. So it's been a really big help for us on our little bit more complex patients. And they can give us ideas on maybe a mode change or a sedation change or just anything that might help us be able to provide better patient care. Telerespiratory is is becoming more popular. We had Kurt Merriman from RT Now on and what they're doing to help patients stay in their community hospitals versus getting transferred out of their community. I know I recently saw an article this week on a group of healthcare providers with the Medical University of South Carolina. They received like a $3.6 million grant to support a large scale research in telehealth for pediatric care. So it's definitely expanding. So with you, you guys were approached by your service provider to say, hey, how can we improve this at a small level to get it out to a 
larger area. When you did this, did you need to get IRB approval for this type of project? So we actually receive IRB approval and we went through that process a little bit after the fact, whenever we discovered that we were probably going to use our data for a poster presentation. We already had our metrics. They're provided monthly to us and quarterly. And once we realized we had seen such an improvement, we decided we really wanted to get the word out and um, we were really proud of our results. So at that time is when I went forward with the IRB. Well, a 24% decrease in median ventilator days is definitely uh, an amazing feat. So for our listeners, IRB is the institute institutional review board. Most hospitals will have something like this if they're doing any research. And if you're doing anything with people or clinical trials, there's 100%. But usually with quality improvement, like Sarah Bush, they found that they had a significant impact on something that they were already doing so they could like backtrack it because it was uh, after the fact. But sometimes that works out that way. Did you use any sp- specific quality improvement method to implement your project? Um, Just best practice of we were really trying to maintain low tidal volume ventilation and we really worked on um, decreasing our sedation on our ventilators. If they didn't pass the wean trial, then we would make sure we weren't over sedating our patients. And I will mention also that this data was not in any way tied to patient identifiers. So it was just all statistics provided to us. Right, because that's another thing that's very important that, you know, everything's de-identified when you're doing sorts of research. So the telemedicine provider, they were also watching your data. So they were kind of pulling all the information for you. Did you guys do any proactive data acquiring or did it just come from them? So one thing that they do that really helps us in real time is respiratory therapists, if they notice that a patient's outside, say the mils per kill idle volume we're looking for, they will call the respiratory therapist here and have a conversation with them about approaching our hospitalist or doctor, whoever's running the vent on that patient. And they also send me an email directly. So there have been times on the weekend that um, a patient was intubated and Maybe someone was busy and it, it may be just over what we'd like to see the range in. And I'll get an email and I can quickly follow up with our with our team here and get that corrected. And it's just it's just another set of eyes on our already really good respiratory therapy department. Oh, that's really great because I know that, you know, we get busy. We are dealing with a crashing patient over here. And then it, depending on the mode of ventilation, things can change and you can end up getting overventilated. And whether you're doing vent checks every two hours or four hours, there's that period of time that they could actually be uh, getting some ventilator induced lung injury just for that period of time. When you were looking at the results in the analysis, did you use any specific data analysis tool or did your vendor assist you with that? Because I think that's really the hardest part. It's you can gather data, but once you're starting to look at it, it's what does that data mean? So because we have this partnership with Advanced ICU, they actually provide us all of the statistics. And when we were looking at our statistics for our median vent day decreasing, we also discovered that our hospital length of stay and our ICU length of stay both decreased by 7 and 10 percent, respectively, during the same time frame as well. No, that's amazing results. So when you saw this, is this what triggered you to think, you know what, we need to get the word out there. Let's try and put together an abstract for AARC's open forum. Not initially. Um, I was just having this conversation and telling a former colleague of mine about the great results that we had seen with, with just this new algorithm and process. And he really encouraged me to, um, you know, write an abstract and try to get um, try to get the word out through the open forum about um, our new process and how we did it. Oh, that's good. I'm glad somebody that kind of like give you that push because sometimes you don't realize the the data gold that you have with that. So when you decided to look into doing the abstract for open forum, what was the first processes? How did you how do you go about writing that abstract? Well, I have really never done anything like this before. I was part of study research um, when I was in college for an undergraduate study. But myself, I did not have any 
experience in this. So I found in a respiratory care journal that um, a few articles that had been written, there's one on how to write an abstract that will be accepted for presentation at a national meeting by David Pearson. And I also read how to present, summarize, and defend your poster at the meeting by Robert Campbell. So I just read a lot of other people's suggestions and made sure I was covering all my bases before I wrote the abstract. So what I do want to highlight is that you never did anything like this before. So for our listeners who think that, you know, every time you see these things, it could be a first time and you got accepted and you presented. And I feel like a lot of people, they're scared of the unknown. So don't let the the fear cripple you from doing something great and, you know, patting yourself on the back when you have such great results. So once you uh, did the research learned how to kind of write that abstract. How were you notified that you were accepted? What was that like? So I think that it was due at the beginning of June and they had until maybe the middle of August to notify us. But I received notification that I was accepted fairly early. It wasn't that long after I had applied. So I I think maybe early July, I received an email notification. And I was very, very excited. As you should be. So from there, now it's early July and AARC Congress is towards the end of the year. What did you do to prepare? And if you could describe kind of like what or open forums like, because I'm I'm assuming, you know, not everybody's been to AARC Congress and, and seen this. Right. So the open forum itself is has been um, going on for about 40 years. And it is open to researchers and clinicians who are presenting their original research. When you first apply, you are you select a category, whether you want to possibly present in posters only or in the poster discussion. Um, they're a little bit different. The poster discussion, which is what I did, the presenters are nearby their poster during their time slot. And then moderators will kind of go around the room and engage in discussion, which helps them build questions to ask after the presentation at the podium. So then after all the posters have been reviewed by everyone, um, everyone does a quick two to three minute overview of their poster. And then it's open for discussion to anyone who's in the room. And so the moderators will ask questions and then people in the audience can ask and talk to you about your poster. The other category was called posters only. And there are posters on display at a certain time. And then exhibitors can walk around and look at the posters. And there is a moderator that I believe goes around the room and just engages with the with the presenter at the poster and is kind of open discussion at that time. There are also selections made each year for editor's choice. And that's chosen by um, individuals from the Respiratory Care Journal. And those are the top abstracts of the year. And those people do a little bit more of a presentation. They get a 10 minute presentation rather than a quick two to three minute presentation. And they get to use PowerPoint slides during theirs. Those presenters are then asked to submit a full manuscript for publication in the Respiratory Care Journal. No, that's great. So that's pretty cool. I mean, what did you learn from the whole experience? I had a really great experience doing this. I am already working on a couple new projects that I'm hoping I can eventually write abstracts for and present again. And um, I would encourage anyone who has any interest in um, original research to take part in this because it's great. And they don't have a limit on how many people can apply or are accepted. I think also, you know, when you hear the word research, it can be scary. This could be a quality improvement project. I've seen abstracts on what's the best ET tube securing device. I've seen some bench studies. So it doesn't always have to be so in depth. It can be something that, you know, you're just working to improve within your department. And I think that it's very important for us to kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, you know what, we did this project. This is our results. Because I know I've every place I've worked, we've always been like, okay, what's the best securing device um, for this or that? And it allows people to learn from each other. Um, what advice would you give others if they're looking to participate in a quality improvement project? I would definitely, I would read the Respiratory Care Journal and other publications to see what research has already been done 
and what's already out there to give you ideas. And I would just consider what what you need to improve at your facility and how you can do better. I think self-reflection and departmental reflection can be a little difficult. You know, you want to always think you're doing the best, but looking in that mirror and saying, you know what, this is an area that we can improve on. This is an area we can be safer. This is an area that, you know, we might be falling a little bit behind to the national standards is a great way of moving our profession forward, your department forward, and just providing the best care possible. On another note, what advice would you give to new grads entering the field? I would definitely encourage new graduates to get a bachelor's degree. I wouldn't stop at a two-year degree and just go right into that. It's Look at online programs and definitely advance your education. Um, You can never have too much education. It's something you can never have taken away from you. And I would just really encourage you to continue to grow, be an AARC member, and definitely promote our profession. I know that you said you're involved with your state society. How does that help you professionally and communicating with your respiratory community in your state? I have been involved with the ISRC for about two years and really it is just great networking and I've been able to meet other managers from across the state get and across the nation really. I've been able to meet other respiratory therapists, get different ideas and we really push conferences in Illinois. Um, Illinois is a very long state and our state conference is held in the very northern part, which is Chicago. And so I'm the chapter four rep, which is downstate Illinois. So it's really important for the southern part of the state to have access to educational events and CEUs as well. I know I've been involved in different state societies in the little U.S. hopping that I've done. And I think that some of the local Education is, is some of my favorite because you can actually get to know and and learn from your local best, you know, not just only the national best. Yeah, we've we've had some really great speakers at our local conferences, some really great doctors. And we've had at our conference here that was held at Sarah Bush because we have this advanced ICU services partnering with us. They provided us a speaker. He was amazing. He came from Baltimore, Maryland to our little local conference here. And he's a professor at Georgetown University. So we were we have access to a lot of really interesting things. You just kind of have to ask sometimes. Well, it never hurts to ask, right? Well, I thank you for your time today. I think it was really informative on thinking about abstracts and quality improvement and what we in our own departments can kind of identify and say, you know what, we're missing the mark here. How can we get there? Thank you for asking me to do this. It's been fun. No problem. Thanks. Thanks.